this is about a guy I met in college. Let's call him Matt, and I never want to see him again. He was 30, and I was 19. At first, Matt never noticed me, which I didn't mind at all. As time went on, I noticed him to become more close and touchy. He had long, greasy hair, wore shorts and sandals, and had an odd smell to him. After about a year, it was clear he developed a crush on me. Being a shy person who doesn't want to hurt anyone's feelings, just let him be himself and feel whatever. My mistake. Over time, he would creepily rub my shoulders and hug me awkwardly. For my birthday, he bought me a Kindle, which I tried so hard to give back. He had emotional issues, and I would listen to him, which made him attract himself even more to me. Once he came up behind me and hugged me, I tensed right up, and he whispered in my ear, Don't run from me. He would often chase me around the school grounds and pick me up against my will, despite me begging to be put down. I cried in the bathroom, and I would hide in the bathroom a lot to avoid him, which was hard to do, since we had almost every class together. One particular day, Matt was holding a little notepad. I was wearing the typical skinny jeans and a plaid shirt. Then Matt told me he really wanted to slap my ass with his notepad. I told him not to, and he slapped my ass, and I walked right out of class. I felt like maybe I was to blame for what I was wearing, but I was so angry and scared to be around him after that point. Matt also had the habit of telling me things he wanted to do to me sexually. He would also tell others what he wanted to do to me. It was very cringy and really gross. I could go on and on about Matt as he did so many creepy and odd things. Thank God he graduated before I did, and I haven't seen him since. So a bit of backstory. I live in a city in Ontario, Canada, and I was attending university for science, and it was currently the end of the semester, so no more classes, just exams. I had to go to one of the science buildings to drop off something to a professor I was doing work on the side for. The science building was one of the separate buildings from the main university center. The school was empty, no students anywhere since exams were going on and the classes were done. I decided to go in the side entrance to the building since it was closer to the parking lot. As I approach the side entrance door, I see a man, maybe 40 years old, with glasses and shoulder-length brown greasy hair and a blue jean jacket standing against the wall by the door. I walk up to the door, smile at him, and he just looks at me with this dreadful straight face and dead eyes. It was like looking into something, but not a person. He just seemed very out of place. As soon as I walk in the door, he turns behind me to walk inside as well. I start walking down the hallway, and now he's following me. I can hear him. I then start walking faster, and so does he. I make the turns down various hallways to get where I need to go, and he's literally right behind me. I start running, and he starts running as well. I was able to outrun him, and I took a sharp corner and ran into the first room that I saw, and it had some students studying in it. I tell them that I'm being followed, and they peek their heads out of the room to check and see where the guy was. They come back in the room and say that he looked really angry and was looking in the male and female bathrooms. I was so scared. Fifteen minutes after, he actually left the hallway. I had the other students walk me to my car, and I drove home. I ended up calling campus security when I got home and told them about the experience. Sure enough, they actually caught him on camera, literally chasing me down the hallway. There was a notice put out for students to watch out for that man. I really wonder what he wanted. I think maybe he would have tried to steal my backpack or something worse. This was easily one of the most terrifying experiences in my life. So creepy man on campus, let's not ever meet. So the title says it all. Here's what happened. We were on a family holiday abroad years ago. I think I was 14 at the time. My sister was 16 and the toddler was our cousin. She was maybe about two years old, maybe older. So we went out during the evening to have dinner and then just walk around the town and maybe stop at a few bars for drinks. As we were walking through this one town, a man who was, I'll say, badly dressed as a clown approached my sister. Keep in mind, my sister is afraid of clowns, no matter how good or badly dressed they are. 
She was carrying her cousin on her hip, and the clown looked at her cousin and said hello to make her laugh as clowns do. My sister, on the other hand, just froze. I was standing by and watching this happen, kind of laughing at the fact that my sister was now crapping herself. I'm a savage sister. Without asking or anything, the clown takes my cousin from my sister, and then of course we thought, whoa, okay, hey. I shouted over to my parents and my aunt and my uncle. My dad comes over and says, what do you think you're doing with my niece? As he's trying to get her back out of his arms. But when he tries, the clown would just turn away or push my dad. The clown then says, I thought you would like to take a photo. Do you not want to take a photo? My aunt comes over, but scared out of her mind, thinking that a clown was trying to kidnap her daughter. We all keep gathering around the clown, trying to pry my cousin from this clown's arms. But every time we do, he kept pulling away or pushing us back. Now my dad's had enough, and he approached the clown and said, Let go of my niece right now, and grabbed him by the neck. In the end, the clown put her down, and my dad picks her up and gives her to my aunt. Then the clown just casually says, Oh, okay, too bad you don't want to take a photo, and hands my cousin a lollipop. We just went back to the hotel and kind of thought nothing about it. But the next day, we saw him again as we were going into a restaurant. This time, he took someone else's kid, like away from the parents, into some room, and my dad spotted him as he was coming out of the toilets. He then stopped him, thinking that he grabbed my cousin once again, but it was actually someone else. Then my dad went back to the table and ate his dinner, but then for a second, he felt something wasn't right, so he went back to the clown's room. I don't know what went down, but when he came back, he was holding this other kid's hand and asked where her parents were, assuming they were in the same restaurant, but no, they weren't. They were at another place. My dad took the kid back to her parents and said, don't let the clown anywhere near your kid, and told them what he tried to do with my cousin. I was kind of freaked out, thinking that this clown was probably a pedophile. When I was in 8th through 10th grade, I was extremely involved in this small building server. The average age was probably 15 to 17, and I joined a group of builders and Skyped with them every weekend for hours. We all became close fast and trusted each other enough that we followed each other on Instagram. I became particularly close with one of the builders in my friend group named Peter. Peter was in the same grade as me, and we ended up texting quite a lot. I heard rumors that Peter might have a crush on me, even though he denied them, which I found laughable because it was the internet and I brushed it off. Everything was fine for a while, until something began to feel off when I talked to him. I was starting to constantly catch him telling small lies. This bothered me, so I figured it was time to distance myself from Peter and stop talking to him. Cut to a few months later of no contact, and Peter out of the blue texts me that he is going to possibly transfer to my high school so he can get in-state tuition for college. Peter's plan is to somehow live completely alone and support himself while in high school. My stomach drops when I read the text, and I know this feels very, very off. I try to be calm and tell him that his plan is crazy. I then tell him it's oddly convenient that he chose my random suburb. Peter insists that his plan is going to work and it was just a coincidence that he was going to my high school. I'm trying to call Peter's bluff and I'm hoping he was just screwing with me because I cut him off. Peter said that he bought plane tickets and he is going to stay in my town and visit some schools in the area. Fear washes over me and I realize Peter definitely has some very unhealthy attachments towards me. Peter was not bluffing. To my horror, he ended up posting a picture on Snapchat at the airport. Peter asked to meet up while he's there, and I of course decline. Later, I see on a Snapchat that he's taking a tour of my high school. Peter was taking a ton of pictures and video in hopes that I would see it. Luckily, however, I was stuck at home with pneumonia. I spent the next few days on edge and afraid that he was going to ring my doorbell at any moment. Luckily, he was not smart enough to find out where I live, and he went home and didn't follow through with his plan. The baffling part was that none of my old friend group in the Minecraft server thought he was doing anything creepy. 
I felt like I was going crazy for thinking that this was weird. I thought my rejection for this meetup and continued no contact would be the end of it. But about two years later, and I just committed to my dream college, I still stupidly followed Peter on social media because I wanted some warning if he came to the area. Once again, Peter did. I saw him posting in front of the library at my college with the caption saying, Transferring here is definitely the move. Cut to a few months later, Peter finds out that I have a boyfriend and directly contacts me for the first time in two years. He starts asking me strange questions like, Will he protect you? I shouldn't have answered, but for some reason I did. I finally blocked him and stopped following him on social media. He hasn't tried contacting me since. I definitely made some mistakes because I was young and scared, and I had others telling me it was not a big deal. So Peter, let's not meet. I already posted this story to Let's Not Meet, but a few commenters suggested that I should also post this story on this subreddit. So here it goes. This is a true story and a situation I'm still currently dealing with. Any advice is very much appreciated. Since almost a year now, end of 2019 to be exact, I had moved into an apartment in a different city because my mother who I lived with passed away from cancer. I moved here with a long-term boyfriend and one other roommate who has been a good friend of ours since before we even started dating. We all love it here. The location is great. However, after just a month, maybe two of living here, someone has started ringing the doorbell at exactly 11.05 on a semi-regular basis, sometimes every day, sometimes every other day, and every single time I get no answer even when I ask through the intercom who it is. At first I thought it was friends from one of our neighbors who accidentally rang the wrong doorbell, but after around the fourth time I grew suspicious. My boyfriend and our roommate both work at bars, so they usually work very late and would usually get home around 2am, so each time it happened I was always home alone. When I first told them, they kind of shrugged it off and said it was probably a wrong dial. But when I told them it was happening so many times and sometimes even daily, they didn't really believe me and thought I was just being a little paranoid and spooked. However, one night when the doorbell rang again, I answered the intercom asking who it was. I then heard very heavy breathing. I was thoroughly spooked and I was home alone. I kept on asking who they were and what they wanted. I wasn't able to tell from the breathing if it was a man or a woman, but I heard a strange mumbling and whispering and then it went dead silent. After that, I started putting the double lock on the apartment door. I was so scared and so spooked. Thankfully, my roommate was home a little earlier that night, around 30 minutes after the doorbell rang. Now with the coronavirus, my roommate and boyfriend aren't able to work anymore, and now they're also witnessing the frequent doorbell rings, so now they do believe me and they agree that it is very odd and it's creepy. We have a balcony that looks down at where our apartment building's main front door is, but there's also a shop that always has the curtain roof things out, so the view to the front door is partially obscured. Every time our doorbell rang, me, my boyfriend, and my roommate would go to the balcony and see if we could see anyone, but we've never been able to. I've also asked my neighbors from our building if their door ever gets rang, but the ones that I've asked all said it's never happened to them. So two weeks ago, my roommate decided to do some investigating and went outside our apartment building at 11 p.m., standing across the street and pretending to smoke while keeping an eye on the door. He said that he did see a man who looked kind of suspicious wandering around our apartment building, who slowed down his pace significantly as soon as he approached our door. But when he spotted my roommate, he quickly walked away. We're not 100% sure if that was the door ringer, but that was very, very suspicious. Our doorbell hasn't rang since that night, but there's a possibility that it will continue again in a few weeks. So strange man who rings our doorbell at 11.05, please stop and let's please never meet. 
This all happened roughly around three or four years ago, but the experience has haunted me almost every single day since it happened. I'll start off by saying that at the time, I was pretty young, single, and very keen to having my first experience with a guy. I spent a while looking through dating apps and talking to people until I finally came across a guy and we had a lot in common, so I thought it would be a good idea to meet up with him since we had been talking for almost a month. Now even though I was only young, I wasn't naive or stupid. I was, and still am, a very cautious and paranoid person, but for some reason, that day, I made what possibly could have been the worst decision of my entire life. I invited him to come spend the night at my house. My parents were away for the weekend, and I had the house to myself, so it seemed like the perfect opportunity for him to come over. He lived around four hours away from my house, yet he was eager and almost desperate to come see me, so he set off as soon as he finished work, which was around 11 a.m. The whole time he was driving to my place, I had a sickening sense of doom, almost if something was going to go very, very wrong. I almost texted him multiple times to tell him that I wasn't interested in meeting anymore, but I hesitated as he was only 10 minutes away by this point. I jump up as I hear his car pull into the driveway, and I expected to be greeted with a smile once I opened the door, but he pushed his way through and continued to stare at me blankly, all while my two French bulldogs snarled and growled at him, which they never, ever do. Things instantly seemed very odd. He followed me quickly to my bedroom and didn't waste any time in aggressively undressing me, which I hesitantly went along with as this was my first experience with a man, especially as he was almost six years older than me, so I was pretty tense. Fast forward to a couple hours later, he suddenly asked me if he could sleep in my room, which confused me as it was only 5 p.m., I told him it was fine, and I would continue watching movies by myself downstairs. After about an hour, I heard what sounded like furniture being moved around and the sound of him talking, so I made my way upstairs, and I found him crouching in the middle of my room and breathing extremely heavily. When I asked him if he was okay, he motioned for me to get on the bed, where he sat me on his lap and proceeded to place a blindfold over my eyes and put his hands around my neck. I was already feeling extremely uncomfortable, which worsened as he tightened his grip around my throat. Then he says, does anyone know I'm here? Do your friends know who I am or what I look like? I instantly answered, saying that my sister and friends who lived nearby knew what he looked like. This was a complete lie, as I don't have a sister, and my friends were unaware, but something inside forced me to say it. After minutes of awkward silence, he stood up in his backpack. He had tape, rope, and handcuffs which at first didn't concern me as I knew he was into that stuff, but looking back, I think it was intended for something much worse. All of a sudden, he said, I think I'm gonna go home. I have a long drive and I'm rather tired. I didn't hesitate and I was already extremely uncomfortable. As he left, he failed to make any eye contact or say goodbye. I ran back to my room and I found a note with the words, being nice is what saved you. I had no idea what the note meant, but now that I think about it, I think he had some very ill intentions towards me. I'm still angry at myself for even letting a stranger into my home, which is obviously a big mistake, and I immediately blocked him on all of my social media. I'm just so lucky that I made it out alive. All I know is that he's now somewhere back in America. I don't really know why he was living in the UK at the time I met him, but all I can say now is that I'm very glad that he is many, many miles away from me. I was watching my daughter's kids while her and her husband go out of town. They have a teenage daughter, let's say her name is Alyssa. At about 3 a.m., I'm woken up by a weird rustling sound, and I look out the window and I saw movement and I saw a bike tossed on the lawn that definitely wasn't ours. 
My first thought was that it was a burglar casing houses, but since he looked young and came through on a bike, I figured that scaring him straight would be enough for him to decide to head home. I didn't want to ruin a teenager's life by calling the cops straight away, so I went on the porch and flipped the lights on. I then said, can I help you, in my classroom voice. The guy looked surprised, but not nervous. He was wearing a Letterman-style jacket, but once I got a clear view of him, he seemed much older than my granddaughter and looked more weary than athletic. He walked up closer to the door and said, Yeah, I'm looking for Alyssa. I then gave him a disapproving glare, hoping he realized he came looking for a girl late at night and a grumpy old person answered, I'm thinking what must have happened is Alyssa knew her parents were going out of town and maybe before she knew I would be staying over, told the secret older boyfriend to come over. It was late and I was alone with several kids, so I didn't want him coming any closer to the house. I also thought it was weird that he came so late and wanted to be sure that Alyssa actually wanted to see him, so I then said, I'm sorry, who? And then he said, Alyssa, you know, Alyssa last name. I then thought, if he knew her full name, they must have been at least friends. I then said, you wait there. He then started walking up. I felt a sick burning sensation in my gut. I then yelled, no, stop, freeze. I then readjusted and said, you stay right there. This is private property. Don't take a step closer. Wait there. So I go in and Alyssa is sleeping just one room over from where the rustling first occurred. I then wake her up and say something to the effect of, I don't know what the big idea was to have a friend over this late, but you need to tell them to go home. At this point, she had no idea what I was talking about. I then say, there's a guy outside asking for you. She gets up and goes to the window. She then sees him and goes white as a sheet. She then said, he asked for me. I replied, yes. By name? Yes. Call the police. I've never seen him in my life. I immediately called 911. As I was on the phone with them, Alyssa started tugging at my arm and saying, he's coming up. I had younger kids in the house to think about, so I kept the door latched and pulled it just open enough for the latch and yelled. I asked my husband, and none of us know an Alyssa last name, leave my property or I'm calling 911. He then got angry and started yelling for her to come out. Thankfully, the police came pretty quickly, and when he heard the sirens, he grabbed the bike and ran off. I watched where he was running towards, and he jumped into the passenger side of a car. The police followed the same direction, but they didn't end up getting him. They advised us to take all of her social media details offline if she was sure that she didn't know this person. They also said they've had a couple similar reports and were looking into it. I ended up getting a heavy-duty lock, and she slept in my room for the remainder of my visit. I'm a 27-year-old female, and I graduated from high school about 10 years ago. In my freshman year of high school, I was well-known and had a lot of friends. I was very friendly, and any time I saw someone alone, I would greet them and offer my friendship. Sometime during the year in my math class, we had a new guy. We will call him Jose. Jose had recently moved to the U.S. from Mexico. He hardly knew any English, and me being Hispanic, I was able to speak in Spanish and make him feel welcome. Jose had no friends and always sat by himself. I started helping Jose a lot during the math class. He sat behind me and always played with my hair. Not actually head, but my hair, so I could hardly feel it. I sort of felt like he had a crush on me, and he wasn't that bad looking, so I didn't mind. For a few months, he would play with my hair, and he said that he really liked my hair. But towards the end of those months, he said that he wanted to play a game, and asked me to write things that I loved most in life, and he would do the same. Then we would both share the papers. Of course, I wrote down my family, God, and a whole bunch of other things. When I gave him back the list, he wanted specific names and said he would do the same. So I ended up writing my friends' and family's names. One day, we were just hanging out in class, and Jose said, Can I show you something? But you can't tell anyone, or else you're gonna have to pay for it. 
I was so confused. I thought maybe he was going to ask me out. Jose then pulled out a Ziploc bag, and I couldn't really tell what was inside. It wasn't until he placed it on the table when I noticed it was a Ziploc bag full of hair. Then he said, my hair. Jose pulled up his sleeve and showed his arms. He had about 10 knife scars that went down his arm. There was one fresh knife wound, and he grabbed my hair and placed it on the freshly opened wound from the night before, and then he said, You are mine now. I know who you love and what you love. If you don't do as I say, you will pay for everything. These are all of the scars and all of the souls that I own. Anything and everything that happens from now on, think of me. My heart sank, and he started smirking. I ran out of class crying and ran to the office. Everyone was so confused, and I asked to speak to my counselor immediately. I then explained what happened. Jose was pulled out of class and taken to the principal's office and was expelled that day. I feared for my life. Then they found all of these notes of other people in his backpack, and mine was there. They also saw the scars and found my hair. I never heard of Jose again. I've had some pretty fucked up shit happen in my life after that, and I've always thought of Jose. I haven't talked about him in years. I'm afraid that if I mention his name, he will hear me, and more bad things is to follow. I got so close with God, closer than ever. To this day, I don't know if Jose was just messing with me, but I will tell you, after that encounter, I am no longer the super friendly and open-hearted person as I was. I was spending a month with my cousins at my grandma's house. It was August, and my cousins' ages ranged from 10 to 15, and I was the oldest, being 15. I was staying with a 10, 13, and 14-year-old. We stayed up telling scary stories often, but one night, a few weeks in, we decided to make a campfire out back. My grandma's house is in a rural suburb. The neighbors aren't too far away when you're driving down the road to her house, but in the backyard, it's a thick forest with man-made paths through it. Each house is on a hill, so part of the basement was actually underground. That isn't really important until later in the story. So, we're walking towards the east side of her yard in a small patch of open land. You couldn't really see the neighboring yards from there, and there was probably three quarters to a mile to each side of us that belonged to my grandma. It was maybe 11 at night, and we were playing truth or dare after telling scary stories, and my 14-year-old cousin dared me and the 13-year-old to walk through the paths for about 10 minutes or so. I said yes right away, as I wasn't easily scared and rather level-headed, but my younger cousin was a bit more hesitant. We didn't bring a flashlight because it wasn't pitch black yet, and we could see enough in front of us not to die. We were walking through the paths for about five minutes, and we could barely see the fire through the trees when we decided to turn. In the middle of the path, there was a dog-like creature hunched over with its front hands an inch from the ground. What I remember most was how its eyes were so fucking bright white, and it was a humanoid dog shape with a human-like head, but dog-like body and human hands and feet. It looked right up at us, and I know that I was paralyzed with fear as it dashed away the opposite way from us towards a creek that ran through the yard. Eventually, my cousin and I screamed bloody effing murder, and the other cousins and my grandma ran to us. I don't remember much here because I was really disoriented and I couldn't think properly, but I ended up waking up in a bed, so I assumed I was brought back to the house. All of the kids slept in the basement in one big room with a sliding glass door to the outside as the room was on the side that wasn't underground. My bed was pressed up against the big window and I could see my cousins were playing outside below. The house is in Michigan, so it gets slightly chilly even at the end of August, and there was a slight breeze, so I put my jacket on and ran outside to join them, skipping breakfast and not wanting to miss out on any of the fun. When I got down there, I could tell that they weren't playing, but rather running to get my grandma. They found both of her dogs were dead and ripped up. That night, we went to bed early. I woke up maybe two in the morning because I felt something hit my head. My cousins were all sitting on the bunk beds opposite to me on the other side of the room. 
There was one bunk bed and two double beds. The bunk beds were for me and the 14-year-old. They were all being quiet and staring at me. The 13-year-old nodded his head towards the window. I then froze, and they all looked afraid. I turned my head slightly to the side, and I saw a really messed up looking face pressed to the window with gaping eyes looking directly at me. I screamed so fucking loud and bolted. My grandma called the police after I told her what happened, and they didn't find anything. Soon after, I went home, and I have never been there during the night again. I'll get right into it. My car died a little while back, and I've been using Lyft to get around town as needed. I'm within walking distance to a good variety of stores, so it hasn't been too pricey for me. However, I recently needed to go to the pharmacy and the pet supply store. Both are too far to walk. So I go to the pharmacy, pick up my prescription, and call my ride to the pet supply store. The driver who picked me up seemed initially polite, asking me how my day was, commenting on the weather, etc. But things got weird very fast. He abruptly asked me if I was hungry. When I said no, he began to insist that we stop at a restaurant and get some food. And he wouldn't stop until I lied to him and said that I just had a very big lunch. Then he asked me if I wanted to get a coffee. I once again said no. He backed off and turned up the radio. A minute later, he asked if I like music and if I like to dance. I answered that I don't really care for dancing, to which he then asked, well, why not? Then he asked if I like to drink, and if so, what bars do I like to go to? At this point, I was starting to feel very uncomfortable. I then told him that I don't really drink too much. He then replied with, well, why not? Not even a little? Not even a little here and there. I then lied and said that alcohol makes me nauseous. He then asked if I lived alone, to which I said no. I told him that I lived with my husband. He asked how long we've been married and if I'm happy with my husband. Then he casually asked if my husband was a strong guy and if he goes to the gym. I began to feel very panicked at this point. Why would this guy want to know if I live alone or how physically strong my husband is? He was very pleasant and cheerful the entire time, but he was staring at me intensely through the rearview mirror. I lied once again and told him that my husband was in the military, and I was so happy that he was now home with me. He then became disinterested after I started gushing about my husband, and then he abruptly turned up the radio. He turned it up so loud that my ears actually started to hurt. I'm not even kidding, the windows were even vibrating. We arrive at the pet store, and I jump out of the car and hurry away. Once I was in the store, I took my time pursuing the aisles to ensure the driver left. I stayed in the store for nearly 40 minutes. It was now rush hour, so I was fairly confident that he received another ride and left. After buying feed for my bunny, I went outside and requested a ride, and I kid you not, the dude was waiting in the parking lot and then whipped his car around front as soon as I walked out of the doors. He immediately accepted my request after blocking me from walking in the parking lot. He then jumped out of his car and took my bag and put it in the car. All of this happened very quickly, and looking back, I should have canceled my ride right then and there. I regret not putting my foot down and calling him out on his creepiness. I froze up and started panicking. I told myself that I was just being dramatic and it was probably a coincidence. I got in his car and realized with misery that my home address is now logged into his GPS. Then I had a stroke of genius and told him that I was actually going to my friend's house for dinner. He didn't seem to like hearing this and gave me the loud radio treatment once again. I arrive home and grabbed my bag so he couldn't try to help me carry it inside. The driver got out the same time I did and pushed a piece of paper into my hand. It had his phone number on it and he said, You will call me tonight when you're ready to go home. Yet, your boy demanded that I call his personal phone to get a ride home after I have dinner with my friends. I refused and he tried to force the paper into my hand, grabbing my fingers and crumpling it up into a fist. I lied once again and said that my friend was driving me home and I dropped the paper on the sidewalk. 
He then finally gave up and went into his car. I walk up to the door, but that's when I realized the driver was still parked and watching me. He saw me looking and quickly pretended to mess on his phone, but I suspected he was waiting to see if my friend would actually come to the door or if I was lying. I casually knocked on the door, waited a moment, then pulled up my phone as if I was going to call my friend. While making the call, I decided to turn around and stare at him. This worked and he eventually eased his car out and drove away. Once he was around the corner, I rushed in the house and locked the door behind me. Hey all, it's great to see that Uber now warns users to always check the license plate before getting into a car, but my story happened about a year before that was put into place. A few friends and I were spending New Year's Eve at a house party. The New Year hit, my friend then ordered a ride. Mind you, all four of my companions were some combination of pissed drunk or baked out of their minds. I was decently buzzed, but by far the most sober of the group, and I assumed the role of mom friend and corralled the group to the street to wait for the ride. It was freezing, pitch black, and the street was completely empty. A car pulled up and my friend announced that it was our ride, so everyone started to make their way over. Out of nowhere, I got this sick feeling in my gut. My lizard brain kicked into overdrive and told me to get the hell away from that ride. That's when I realized the car was missing their Uber sticker. Since my friend was too drunk to care, I grabbed her phone to check the license plate. This was not our Uber. I realized this at the same moment my friend walked to the driver's side of the window to ask if this was the ride for Sarah, and he told her that it was. I yelled to her that this was not our ride, but she was too gone to care. But he said he's our driver, she slurred. I channeled my inner camp counselor and yelled to her that this was not our driver and the car had the wrong license plate. Instead of walking away from the car, she asked him why the license plate was different and if he was really there for Sarah. And I kid you not, this effort tells her that he put the wrong license plate on the car this morning and she was so drunk that she actually believed him and almost opened the door to get inside. I yelled at her to get the F away from the car right now because this was not our driver. Finally, she started to walk away, but the driver grabbed her arm and tried forcing her inside. The friend next to Sarah pulls her away, but the guy visibly looked unhinged at this point and ordered her to get inside. The first thing that I could think to do was grab my phone and start filming, and that's when I yelled, Hey, a-hole, I'm filming you! This got his attention, and he was down the street before I could say another word. Not a second later, our real ride pulls up. We were all spooked, but they were all drunk, tired, and ready to let it go and keep the night going. All I could think of was some drunk girl leaving a party and forgetting to check the license plate. So was the only one who wanted to do something, but also the only one under 21. I decided to call the police. Not great in hindsight, but I would rather get busted for just being shy of 21 and kind of buzzed than letting someone possibly get kidnapped or whatever else. It all turned out just fine, and they caught the guy before he could find another victim, but we never found out what his motive was or what happened after that. The best part of the entire ordeal, though, was one of the guys in our group and his reaction. I've known him since kindergarten, and he's one of the smartest people I know, but he was so cross-faded that he actually believed the guy was just being nice and trying to help us out. He tried convincing me not to call the police, because it would only ruin the guy's night, and since it was New Year's, he should have fun. He still denies that he ever said this. In conclusion, always check your Uber's license plate. So for a preface, I was 19 and working at a mall in my town. My town is relatively calm, never any major crimes committed, but the city that's about 15 minutes out used to have the highest murder rate in Canada. The mall I worked in was pretty small. The usual customers were moms with their kids or older people just trying to pass the time. Not a sketchy type of mall at all and very safe to work at. One day, I was on my break and I went to the food court to get a drink and sit down and browse on my phone as usual. 
I noticed two women walking towards me, and my first instinct was that they saw my uniform, and they were going to ask me something about a product I sold at my store, and I thought nothing sinister of it. They come up to me and sit down. They both have heavy accents, though I'm not sure exactly which kind, but it was one that I had never heard before. They were dressed in very classy clothes, as if they were going to church, and they seemed pretty normal. Then one of the women pulls out a book and begins asking me some very odd questions, such as, Do you go to church? And, Do you believe in God? Mainly just stuff that has to do with religion. I assume they belong to some sort of church. Then they began telling me stories about God the Mother. With me being extremely shy, I just listened. Then they asked me if I would be able to come with them to a youth group that they had going on that night. I told them that I would be working, and I was only on my break, and I wasn't able to go, and then they continued to insist. Finally, they got the message, and I wouldn't be going with them, so they asked me for my phone number and told me that they would text me the next time that they arranged one and I would be able to go. I really didn't want to talk to them anymore, and I wanted them to leave, so I agreed, gave them my phone number, and left. A couple of days later, I got a message from one of them trying to arrange something, but I ended up just blocking the number and thinking nothing of it. It's not that I thought they were planning on hurting me, I just didn't want to go to the group. A couple of months later, I was reading in the news, and there was a story warning young girls about human trafficking in my city. It went on to say that women would come up to you and talk to you about God the Mother and try to get you to leave with them. So thank goodness I didn't finish work yet, and thank goodness I never responded to their messages. It's so weird to me to think that if I did go with them, I would probably not even be in Canada right now. This is my first time writing a post, so I hope it will satisfy you. For a little background story, I am a scout since about 8 years old, and last year I was the leader of my team, so I had to do all of the paperwork and call for finding places to camp. It was mid-November and I had to find us a place to camp, but since I was lazy, I decided to wait about a week before the actual weekend. A week before the weekend, I decided to call some owners, so we had a place to sleep. As I call, all of the owners are either unavailable or simply not there. Then I see a number, which I have never called before, since it was on the end of the list. I call, and an old woman picked up the phone. I then do a basic presentation. She agrees and lets me and my team stay at her site, and we made the arrangements. That afternoon, I went to the property to check everything out, such as portable water and a place to put the tent and the campfire. The place was dark, but it was nice. The week passes and Saturday arrives. The Saturday went well. We did a bunch of great games, ate a ton of food, and had a great night show. As everyone went to sleep, I stayed awake to finish the paperwork for the next day. It was now going on midnight, and I decided to get some sleep since we had to wake up early to go to church. As I switched off the flashlight, one of my newbies, there are eight in total, needed to go to the bathroom, and she asked me to go with her. I can understand, since it's better to be accompanied at night, especially in the woods. She does her business, and I suddenly hear some noises that were kind of far, but not that far. I tell myself it was nothing. It had to be an animal looking for food. We go back to the tent, and that's when I hear some footsteps approaching. As I hear those footsteps, I remain calm and tell myself it must be the old lady checking to see if we made the fire too close to the tents or something like that. I still have an odd feeling because it was midnight and why would she be doing this at this hour? Then I hear no more footsteps for roughly 10 minutes. Then I hear more coming. Thankfully all of my girls are sleeping because they would have been scared. As I hear the footsteps which seem to be coming from one person, I hear more coming from the opposite side of the tent and I was like, okay, now this is getting weird. I need to do something. I check the tent by the inside, and thank God, one of my newbies left some of the embers from the fire going, so I could actually see what was between the fire and the zip of my tent. 
A minute passes by and a silhouette is just there between the fire and my tent. I stopped breathing. I literally froze. I started to move towards my phone when I saw the silhouette coming closer. I sent a message to one of my bosses who are always camping in the area if anyone needs anything. I knew that she would take a while, so I had to do something, and fast. That's when I had an idea. I set my alarm off on my phone like a big siren. Sometimes we would do night games and wake up in the middle of the night, and all of the girls woke up. The silhouette had actually started to unzip my tent. I actually saw fingers coming from below. But as the silhouette heard the girls waking up, she or he sprinted to where they came from. And that's when I saw two other silhouettes sprinting back to the same direction. Everything ended well. 20 minutes later, my boss came and stayed the night and I never had to deal with those silhouettes again. As usual, this is my first Reddit post. So this happened my junior year of high school. One of my best friends invited me to a Halloween party at her house with our school friends and some of her friends from a previous school. When I got there, I was wearing a poor iteration of a Tom Cruise in Top Gun. My friend then introduced me to this girl and we actually hit it off really well. She told me that my friend had told her a lot about me, and they actually knew each other through their parents' work. We started talking about our interests, and we were decently flirting with each other. Now I had gotten out of my first real relationship earlier that year, and I was not one to hop around from girl to girl, so being really flirty with someone on my first time meeting them was not something I was used to doing. At the end of the night, we were sitting on the ground floor of my friend's house, and we ended up kissing for a little bit, which again was moving very, very fast for me. We started texting after that. I had a weird feeling about her, and I couldn't really see myself in a relationship with her. But prior to realizing that, we made plans for a date with my friend who threw the party and her boyfriend. When the day of the date came, I had come down with a 101.7 fever, and I felt very, very out of it. I called her and explained what was going on, and I was very sick and very sorry I wouldn't be able to make the date. This was a solid three or four hours before the date, so I wasn't pulling this at the last minute. Her response kicked off the most backward period of my high school life. She responded by saying, well, I wasn't going to tell you this earlier, but I have brain cancer, so I don't have much time to go on dates. The strangest part was that she asked me not to tell anyone about the cancer. She stated that this was because her father didn't want her to use cancer as a way to work people over to get things, which I found odd. Now a little backstory. I had a football coach who passed away from cancer, and my friend's mom, the one who threw the party, also developed cancer around this time, so the topic of cancer was very heavy on my heart, and being the emotionally charged person that I am, I decided to go on the date. During the date, she started saying that she really appreciated me coming, and the way that I treated her. This made me feel better knowing that I was helping. At a point near the end of the date, we were walking towards my car. She again brought up the way that she appreciated me treating her. She followed it up by explaining that she wasn't used to guys treating her right because she was sexually assaulted when she was younger and had to have an abortion due to a forced pregnancy at the hand of a male relative. My heart broke for her as she sounded like she had endured a lot of hardship on top of the fact that she was supposedly going to pass away from cancer in the next year. I was an emotional wreck following the date because it was a lot for me to take on, but I knew that if I all of a sudden stopped talking to her, I would never forgive myself. At this point, I had a small sense of suspicion of all the things that she was telling me, especially about the part of not telling anyone under any circumstances. That, along with a few of the things that she was saying on her date regarding what she wanted to do with her future, and saying things like, Oh, when I get older, I want to try out that hairstyle. After she said those things, she would tense up. 
I chalked it up to her coming to terms with the fact that she would not be able to do those things, but my suspicions grew and grew, and I eventually decided to do some investigating. Her father was a doctor at the place that I went for doctor things, and my personal doctor was a family friend of mine who knew her father well. I asked her if there was anything I could do to support or help out regarding the cancer. My doctor then looked at me and said, What cancer? She doesn't have cancer. I immediately became filled with anger and texted her what I had learned. A day before she called me to let me know that her diagnosis was a mistake, but her tone was very melodramatic and not at all what you would expect as a response to finding out you did not have a deadly disease. She tried covering her tracks and was asking why I would question her. I'm livid. I block her on everything and her number. I then fell into a pretty deep depression for several weeks because of how much I was yanked around and this interaction led me to have major trust issues with women which I still have not gotten over. A couple of weeks later, I got a Facebook message request from a name that I did not recognize. She made a fake profile and was telling me that I was being super immature and she told me that she has some explaining to do. I of course didn't answer and that was the last I heard of her until a year and a half later. I had signed up for the ACT retake exam at my local university and when I got there and sat down, I looked one or two in front of me and a few seats to the right and guess who was there? We ended up talking and she apologized for everything that she did in a relatively believable manner and I forgave her. I never found out if any of the other things that she told me from her home life were true, but I made sure to avoid her at all costs, which was a pain because she worked at a cold stone that was about two minutes away from my house. Now I had to go to the one downtown, which was a pain. I came across her real Facebook profile recently. It seems like she's doing well, which I'm glad to see, but as far as our interactions go, let's not meet again.